Hello friends, welcome to the Edisite Network. Our today's topic of discussion is Medieval Indian History, Delhi Sultanate. And for this discussion, we have this in the studio, Dr. Vipul Singh, Associate Professor, Department of History, University of Delhi. And his specialization includes Medieval Indian History and Environment. And a book pertaining to this very topic which uh, is uh, published is called Interpreting Medieval India. So we would request all the viewers to consult this book as uh, you take, as you absorb the lecture as well. And uh, additionally, he has been a Carson Fellow in Germany as we share more about him. And uh, with this, let us welcome sir for being here. Thank you, sir. And uh, we shall request you to begin the lecture. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, in our last lecture, we discussed about the economy of the early medieval period, that is the period between the 8th and the 12th century. Now the moment we enter into the period of uh, Delhi Sultanate, we have huge amount of sources available to us. We move from all those inscriptional records in the coinage and archaeological excavations and the records therein to variety of chronological, uh, uh, what you call this, narratives which were written in Persian. Now all these records which were written in Persian allow the historians to study the period of Delhi Sultanate in a more intense way. However, at the same time, I would also say that just because of this proliferation of uh, written records, it makes the history of Delhi Sultanate more structured. Although there are limitations to these structured history which we actually study. For the earlier period, we largely depended on inscriptions, coinage and other records, we do not find much evidence of written narratives and chronicles. Now it gave a huge amount of scope to the historians to argue and debate on various topics and that is why in the earlier period we find that a number of interpretations came. We heard of the Indian feudalism model, we heard of even the Asiatic mode of production model given by Karl Marx, we heard of the integrative polity model and we also heard of the free peasant economy model. Now slightly different from that is the period of Delhi Sultanate where you have as I told you earlier a number of Persian records available for us. And then these Persian records are read by historians and then presented before us. But the limitation of these narratives and the chronicles of the Delhi Sultanate period are that most of them are sponsored by the Delhi Sultans. So, if we want to actually study the history of Delhi Sultanate in a more critical way, it becomes very difficult. It was because of this reason that in the early stages of the growth of historiography of Delhi Sultanate, we find that the Delhi history of Delhi Sultanate was presented before us in a just plain and simple way. It was more of a political history. But the moment we moved to ahead and historians started reading in between the lines what is written there in the Persian records and what is not, then we come across a lot of other details related to Delhi Sultanate. So in that sense, Delhi Sultanate is one of the most significant uh, period of medieval Indian history. Now, 
just because we have a lot of sources available for the medieval Indian history period. There are historians who believe that Delhi Sultanate should be considered as a major break, as a major break in terms of history. There should be, you know, a study of Delhi Sultanate in a more uh, broader way because for the earlier period we did not have so much of sources available. And also historians argue that Delhi Sultanate came, established itself in India, especially in northern part of India and then changed the entire economy. So there are, you know, different views among historians about the state of economy after the establishment of Delhi Sultanate. So in this historiography of the economy of Delhi Sultanate, the early writings consider Delhi Sultanate as a break but in a negative sense. Negative sense because they felt that the coming of the Delhi Sultanate led to denudation and destruction of human resources. We have historians like Lalanji Gopal who said that the coming of the Turks actually led to the poverty in northern India and in fact the poverty which was already existing there it got a fillip, further fillip and it all in fact expanded. We also have historians like K. S. Lal who say that uh, the Muslim rule was the prime mover in the growth of the Muslim population in India. But we would see that all these early description of the historians of the economy of Delhi Sultanate or maybe you know the implication of the establishment of Delhi Sultanate are largely based on the description given by the British historians Eliot and Dowson who wrote a book titled History as Told by Its Own Historians. So we find that there are a number of other historians who read the Persian sources in its original form. They believe that their study of the Persian sources suggest that this new regime of Delhi Sultanate was qualitatively different from the earlier ones. So we should actually consider Delhi Sultanate as a break and in a positive sense. One of the leading historians who talked about the establishment of Delhi Sultanate as a break in a positive sense of the term was Muhammad Habib. He said that the establishment of Delhi Sultanate actually released new social forces and it allowed to create a better economic organization which was far superior to the earlier existing ones. He also suggests that there was kind of a professional mobility which became very common, professional mobility of the artisans. And now the artisans could, you know, move beyond their own traditional craftsmanship. He used two terms uh, while he was discuss discussing about the implications of establishment of Delhi Sultanate. And he uses the terms called the uh, rural revolution and the urban revolution. Now for ru him, rural revolution meant improved production by the peasants and this happened because he believed that the coming of the Turks and the establishment of the rule by Delhi Sultans actually removed the intermediaries like the Khuts, Mukaddams and Chaudhuri's uh, in between the state and the peasantry. 
Muhammad Abi believes that all these intermediaries used to collect a lot of revenue other than what the state actually demanded and this led to the suppression of the peasantry. Now as a result of the removal of these uh, landed intermediaries, we find that the peasants become much more productive and now the production, the agricultural production actually increases in Delhi Sultanate. Now it also happened because the Delhi Sultanate rulers wanted more and more revenue from the rural areas. The second terminology that he uses is the urban revolution and to him urban revolution actually meant the expansion of towns and artisanal activities with the coming of new technologies which the Turks brought from Central Asia and also because of their contacts, constant contacts with Central Asia, many new technologies came. He also says that the social and economic condition for the earlier centuries, that is the uh, early medieval period, we did not have much scope for urbanization. Although we studied in the last lecture that you know this urbanization actually took place in the earlier period also. So we cannot set aside this whole idea of urbanization. But mind you Muhammad Habib was writing much earlier than that when all this new concept of urbanization in early medieval period came about. Muhammad Abib also says that the Turkish rule put an end to the caste system and the caste based industries because the Turks appreciated the talent and the expertise of the artisans. So it allowed the artisans to move upward and this what Muhammad Abib calls as enfranchisement. Now on this whole uh, concept of uh, rural revolution and the urban revolution, there are differences of opinion even among those historians who believe that the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate was a major break in a positive sense of the term. We have historians like Irfan Habib, although he agrees with the idea of many changes that had happened with the coming of the Turks and the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate rule, but he has reservations on the use of the term revolutions. He believes that with the coming of the Turks came you know new concepts of spinning wheel, the sericulture, the carpet weaving, many building te technologies like we find at the Kutub complex when there was a use of cementing lime and uh, vaulted roofing. So new idea of arch was also introduced and the dome was introduced. So all this came because the Turks brought this whole idea and concept from Central Asia. There was also growth of uh, commerce and this is reflected with the new coinage that they were minting. So the Delhi Sultans are said to have minted a lot of new coins. Then there was also immigration of the artisans and the merchants from the Islamic East to India and this also indicates that the economy of the Delhi Sultanate was prospering at that time. That is why more and more people from Central Asia 
were coming to Delhi Sultanate. So, overall, Irfan Habib agrees with this whole idea of change that happened because of the establishment of Delhi Sultanate. But then he says that we should not give it the name of a revolution because revolution is a much broader term. Before we move further, let us talk about a little bit about the establishment of Delhi Sultanate. Now, as we learnt earlier that the 10th and the 11th centuries in North India, these were a period when you have the emergence of very small regional kingdoms. In Central Asia also, this was a period when new kingdoms were rising into prominence under the Islamic influence. And there you have the two major cities, the Ghazna and the Gur, which emerged very prominent as two major centers of power. But the political situation in Central Asia brought the rulers of these two kingdoms in India and this laid the foundation for the establishment of Delhi Sultanate rule later on. Although we cannot say that the invasions which Mahmud of Ghazna made in India were in any way directly related to the establishment of Delhi Sultanate rule. But so far as the invasion of Muhammad Ghori is concerned, he by his sustained control of the northwestern territories in the Punjab region and the appointment of governors therein actually laid the foundation of Delhi Sultanate. We know that Mahmud of Ghazna made 17 plundering raids between the period 1000 to 1027 AD. And many of his raids were around the temples in the temple cities. His campaigns were invariably launched in the hot summer. And it was his tactics that he used to leave India before the onset of the monsoon because he very much understood that during the monsoon the rivers overflow and it will be very difficult to retreat back. Mahmud Ghazni's raids were very significant in terms of wealth because although there were historians who talked about his invasion in terms of his religious motive, but the recent writings have proved that most of these raids were for the wealth. And since all these temples which he raided were full of wealth, he actually attack these temples rather than the state capitals. Mohammed Ghori was another ruler who came almost 150 years after Mahmud Ghazni's invasions. And uh, his strategy was slightly different from Mahmud Ghazni. He, instead of looting the temples, concentrated on controlling the territories because Gori supposedly uh, tried to establish a kind of an empire in India because he was uh, facing some kind of a destability in his own territory. One of the important and very powerful rulers of North India at that time was Prithviraj Chauhan 
who posed a very powerful challenge to Muhammad Ghori, but he could not be successful. And Prithvira Chauhan was finally defeated in 1192, although the earlier war of 1191 was won by Prithviraj. However, after some time, Muhammad Ghori left this part of India which he had controlled and uh, he in fact appointed his uh, governors to these territories. Now, the governors which he appointed were mostly his slaves and a few of the important slaves who were appointed as governors were Yaldus who was at, appointed at Ghazna. Then we have Kabacha who was ap appointed at Uch. Then we have Kutubudi Nabak who was at Delhi who later uh, became the establisher of Delhi Sultanate. And then there was Bhaktiyar Khalji who was appointed at Bengal. Kutubudi Nabak somehow managed to take control of few other territories from the earlier governors after the death of Muhammad Ghori and then established the Sultanate with the capital at Delhi. That is why it is known as the Delhi Sultanate. Now, in his throughout his reign, Kutubuddin Abak was busy in uh, you know consolidating his position throughout the one over territories. So, he hardly won any new territory or he hardly added any new territory to the Delhi Sultanate, but because he was much more involved in the initial years in you know surviving himself as the Sultan of Delhi. But the ruler who came after him, Iltutmish, was uh, a ruler with conviction and he introduced many reforms. Uh, the moment he came, he introduced silver tanka and copper zital. These were the Arabic coins which were issued from Delhi. Iltutmish is also credited with introducing the Ikta system about which we will discuss in detail later on. Then he is also famous for his concept of the Chehelgani loyal nobles. Then he also completed the construction of Qutub Minar in Delhi. Qutub Minar is actually uh, many people uh, get confused with the name of Qutub Minar and believe that Qutub Minar was constructed by Qutubuddin Abak, but this is not the truth. Qutubuddin Abak was not the builder of it, it was Il Tutumish. And it was dedicated to one of the Sufi saints, Kutubuddin Bhaktiyar Kaki. That is why it is known as Kutub Minar. Iltutmish accession to the throne of Delhi constitutes one of the important landmarks in the history of Delhi Sultanate. It marked a growing power of the Turkish nobility in India, and Delhi became the hub of political activity of the Turkish rule. After him, the most important and significant ruler who came to rule from Delhi was Balban. Balban was originally one of the nobles of from the Chehilgani group of Iltutmish. But after becoming the Sultan, Balban first of all tried to restore the supremacy of the crown by 
crushing the power of the Turkish nobility. Because he had experienced that the nobility used to create a lot of problem for the Sultan to take decisions. His accession to the throne of Delhi also proves that the principle of heredity was not relevant here in Delhi Sultanate. So anybody who has the maximum support of the nobles would become the ruler of Delhi. There is a map uh, which shows the territories which were under the control of Delhi Sultanate. These are the dotted lines and this is a period when Balban was ruling. In fact, uh, this is a period of uh, end of Iltutmish rule and uh, Balban actually took control of this entire area. Few of the highlights of Balban's rule apart from his uh, making the crown as an important position was the introduction of the practice of Sizda and Paibos in which people were required to kneel down and touch the ground. And then he also put the end to this influential Turkane Chehalgani group. He also abolished the post of Nayak so that the Sultan is the absolute controller of authority. Balban also gave instruction to the ulamas to confine themselves uh, to religious affairs and not to engage in political activities. He also reinforced forts at Batinda, created a department of Diwan e Arj. Arij, this is a department of military affairs which was created for the first time in Delhi Sultanate. Now, in the late under the later rulers, the nobility also became much more multifarious. They were from different backgrounds. If we look at the hierarchy of administration under Delhi Sultanate, we will see that there are sultans and under the sultan there are very, uh, a lot of provinces and each of the province was divided into a number of parganas and then the parganas were divided into villages. You have one uh, unit of ulamas who actually were responsible for all the judicial activities and then you have Diwane Vizarat, Iktadars, these were all parallel to the provinces and the Parganas. The Sultan was of course the nucleus of all uh, activities and he was also the commander of the army and the ulama actually gave all the judgments related to the nobility and the Islamic population. In making his judgment, uh, the ulama followed the shariat, which is Islamic law. And if the traditional customs uh, of the people were at variance uh, with the Shariat, the Sultan used to make use of Jawabit, which were developed by the Sultan. So in a way, Ulama was the religious head of the organization. We also had Wazir. And he, it was one of the most important offices of Delhi Sultanate after the Sultan and the Ulama. 
and the wazir used to supervise all the functions of the department. He was also an advisor to the sultan and he also led the military expeditions of the sultan's army. Wazir's office and his own personal officers used to keep a check on the land revenue collection that used to come from different parts of Delhi Sultanate. The Wazirat uh, maintained a record of income and expenditure which were incurred by the state and Wazir was also responsible for making donations like the works and the inams to different departments. The different functionaries of the province, the entire Delhi Sultanate as I suggested earlier was divided into different provinces. So the different functionaries of this province were headed by the Wali. In fact, the provincial governor was known as Wali and then there was an officer called Shikdar who used to collect the revenue. So he was responsible, not, he was a, not the collector of revenue, but he was responsible for the collection of revenue. We also had this Fauzdar who used to maintain law and order. This province was divided into various Parganas and the Parganas were divided into various villages. The village level functionaries included the Mukaddams, the Patwaris, the Khuts. These were all intermediaries which as I mentioned earlier that rulers like Alauddin Khalji eliminated these intermediaries and the state did not allow any intermediaries to collect any kind of revenue from the peasantry. So the state was wholly responsible for the collection of taxes from the peasants. Army organization uh, was uh, headed by Arizem Malik and the army was organized on the basis of the decimal system that is the army was headed by uh, 10 soldiers were headed by one commander and similarly you know 10 commanders were headed by another super commander. So this whole concept of uh, the decimal system actually came from Central Asia which the Sultans of Delhi implemented here in India and it was also part of the Ikta system because Iktadars were given the land from where they collected the revenue and out of this revenue the Iktadars were also supposed to maintain the soldiers. So and these soldiers, these contingents were based on the decimal system. So far as the income of the state is concerned, the primary source of the income of the state was of course the land revenue. We do not get any information about any other major source of revenue. Of course, we do have uh, mention of the Gharai and the Charai and since we do not have any coastal trade taking place, so there is hardly any mention of any shulk or any coastal kind of duties. The state held large tracts of land which were tilled by the farmers and the land which were held by the state were known as the Khalisa land. The revenue from this Khalisa land came to the central tre treasury and these revenues from the Khalisa land were collected by the Amils. 
the various types of revenue can be divided into two categories. There was one category called the Fai and in Arabic means booty obtained from the infidels. Then you also have the Zakat. These were the taxes paid by all the practicing Muslims. The Fai was further divided into Khams, Jajia and Kharaj. Zakat was another tax uh, which was on flocks and commerce and agricultural produce. Kham was a term used for mainly for booty and as per the Shariat, one fifth of the booty was state's uh, share. Jajia was also imposed on the non-Muslims and in return for the collection of Jajia, the non-Muslim used to get protection of life and property and they were also exempted from military services. The Kharaj was a tax on cultivation. Now, in order to collect these taxes and revenues, before Alauddin Khalji, we had the intermediaries called the Khuds Mukaddams and Chaudhrys, which were removed once Alauddin Khalji became the Sultan. But one of the important uh, institutions of revenue collection was the Ikta system, which was earlier introduced by El Tutmish. Ikta was basically a territorial assignment and it was given to the administrative officers and nobles in lieu of their services which they rendered to the Delhi Sultanate. The holder of the Sikta was known as Mukti. So the Mukti apart from being an administrative head was also responsible for the collection of revenue from the territory which he has been given by the state. This Mukti, the, the Ikta holder, were required to retain the revenue amount equivalent to their personal pay as well as the salary of the troops which he maintained. And the surplus, if any, which he actually had, was supposed to be deposited, deposited to the royal treasury. Now this whole Ikta system was introduced by El Tutmesh, but the details of it actually is uh, received to us from one of the medieval texts called the Siyasat Nama, which was written by Nizamul Mulk Tusi. The territory or the revenue for which were directly collected from uh, the land and which were not the Ikta land and the revenue collected from these land which directly come to Sultan's treasury for his own maintenance were known as the Khalisa land. Now this Khalsa land, we will see that the share or the proportion of the Khalsa land kept on increasing the moment Delhi Sultans become more powerful. So in the initial stages of Delhi Sultanate rule, we find that the proportion of Ikta land is much bigger, but the moment powerful rulers like Alauddin Khalji and Mohammed bin Tughla come to rule, the portion of Ikta land reduces and the portion of the Khalsa land increases. What does that mean? This means that the control of the state, because the revenue from the Khalsa land was supposed to come to the Sultan directly, 
So the control of the state is actually increasing. Under Balban, we do find some changes taking place in the Ikta system which Iltutmis had earlier introduced. He was the one who took, who took very strong steps and he removed all those old Ikta servers, old people who were given Iktas or maybe there, there were many Iktadas who had died and their sons were holding the Iktas. Balban also uh, took a step to inquire into the income and income of these muktis. And for that, he appointed uh, an accountant called uh, Khwaza, who was nominated to ascertain the actual revenue available in a particular ikta. He also appointed uh, informers for this, who were known as the Barids. And they were appointed to report on the activities of the iktadars. Under Alauddin Khalji, uh, with the expansion of the empire to far off areas, because Alauddin Khalji had con taken control of a huge area. Now, in all these peripheral areas, newly controlled areas, iktas were given, but the areas which were closer to Delhi and were, which were in existence for a long period of time, they were converted into Khalsa land. Further, Alauddin Khalji also dared to take the step of paying the troops in cash. So earlier, the commanders or the military were paid in terms of iktas, but now Sultan has so much of money with him that he could pay them in cash. Now this practice of paying the soldiers in cash actually continued even under the reign of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. The attempt to monitor the ikta reached its climax uh, during the time of Muhammad bin Tughlaq who ruled around 1325 and 51 AD. And in several cases we find that a wali was appointed in addition to an amir in the same territory. However, in the later rulers like Firusha Tughlaq, we find that the, a decline took place in the Ikta system. He, Firusha Tughlaq, adopted the policy of assigning the wajah or the revenue collected from village in lieu of the salary. Hereditary system was also introduced. Now the iktas were no more transferable and a system of sub assignments also started which in fact became very common in the Sikandar Lodi. All these indicate that the ikta system which had evolved and had become so workable under rulers like Alauddin Khalji and Muhammad bin Tughlaq actually declined. Now, what are the views of the historians on this working of the Ikta system and its role in the economy of Delhi Sultan? Irfan Habib, who has written a lot on the Ikta system, he believes that uh, Ikta was conducive to the political centralization of Delhi Sultan. He actually believed that the Ikta was one of the most ideal models 
and institutions through which the Delhi Sultanate became so powerful. It was on the basis of the Ikta system that the Sultanate collected a lot of revenue and resources from the peasantry and it was on this basis that such a powerful state like Delhi Sultanate could emerge. Because of this collection, huge amount of collection of huge amount of revenue from the Ikta holders, the Sultan was in a position to pay his commanders and he was also in a position to raise such a huge army. In fact, Alauddin Khalji is said to have maintained soldier of some 1 lakh contingent. So, maintenance of such a huge army during those days was possible only on the basis of the sustained land revenue collection. And this Ikta system actually helped the state to collect the revenue. I must also mention here that when the Delhi Sultans came to rule in the early years, they were not in knowledge of the kind of revenue system in existence in northern India. So, the best possible thing that they could have applied here was the Ikta system about which they had a lot of knowledge and it also suited their requirements. Now, what were the two major requirements when the Delhi Sultanate was established? First requirement was maintaining the army that the Sultan had raised to keep himself to be a Sultan. And the second requirement was the maintenance of those soldiers through the collection of revenue. So, keeping a military, maintaining them and collection of the revenue, these are the two basic fundamental requirements of the early Delhi Sultans. And this Ikta system served both these purposes because this Ikta holders were given those newly conquered areas. So, they control, they also control the area, they were able to collect the revenue and out of the revenue collected, they maintained the soldiers from it. And when there was any invasion taking place by the Sultan, these Ikta holders used to provide these soldiers to the Sultan. So, that is how the Ikta system was so workable and in uh, the benefit of the Delhi Sultanate. But there are uh, historians and the re on the basis of the recent writings, they suggest that the Ikta should not be given so much of importance if we deal with the economy of Delhi Sultanate or even the sustained existence of Delhi Sultanate. They question that had this Ikta been a measure of such tried and tested efficacy, it would have had a pattern of uniformity to it. But we see that it kept on changing under each ruler. So, it altered its character from one regime to another. But let me also suggest here that even a very uh, well worked institution like the Jagirdari which was introduced by the Mughals, the Jagirdari in the Mansabdari system. Mansabdari system is considered to be one of the finest uh, innovations of the time and 
it was one of the essential elements in the sustained existence of the Mughal Empire. But even the Mansardari system did not evolved into a very powerful Mansab system in one go. And it actually the various features kept on changing under different Mughal rulers. Similarly, this Ikta system also kept on changing because there were, I mean, the sultans could observe the requirement of the state gradually. So, with the gradual requirement of the state, the sultan actually made certain changes and altered the features of the Ikta system. To conclude our discussion, we may suggest that the establishment of Delhi Sultanate did bring about many changes in the economy of northern India. Although uniformity and the uniform pattern of economy throughout the northern India is questionable because the boundaries of Delhi Sultanate did not remain the same for such a long period. Because if we look at the period of Delhi Sultanate, it all started from 1206 and even if we consider Firushat Tughlaq to be the ruler from whom the disintegration started. So, the entire 13th and the 14th century is a period of Delhi Sultanate. But in this entire period, it was only under Alauddin Khalji and Muhammad bin Tughlaq that the Delhi Sultanate extended its boundary even down south. So, there is of course no uniformity of economics or economy possible for the entire Delhi Sultanate. But the core area of Delhi Sultanate which always remain under the control of the Delhi Sultan certainly experienced a uniform pattern of economy. With this I end the discussion. Thank, thank you. you so much sir and uh, thank you for this very uh, lucid presentation and also very descriptive so that the students could get a better hang of it. Sir, as we have a few minutes left, uh, I could probably ask you a question that would also help the students in clarifying some points. Sir, uh, you mentioned that uh, as part of the urban revolution, the Turkish rule put an end to the caste system. Is that true? Uh, did they really? Uh um, there was no, uh, you know, any rule passed that they are ending the caste system. But the way, you know, the sultans of Delhi worked, right. it actually meant that it is an end of the, when they are not in favor of the caste system. Right. So, they did not encourage it. They did not encourage it. Okay. So, was there also any policy or any uh, rule, probably not written, but sort of conveyed that they should not uh, encourage this? This otherwise? is what, you know, uh, many of the historians suggest that when the Delhi Sultans came, they started promoting all these artisans, because earlier on, we find that these artisanal activities were highly attached to the caste right. and the caste categories. Right. You know, uh, leather worker is always a leather worker. Right. Uh, you know, a cloth maker is always a cloth maker. But this is for the first time on the Delhi Sultanate that we find that the mobility is taking place. Right. So there is a pro it's, it's called the professional mobility. So now the artisans can move from one profession to the other right. beyond their caste categories. Right. So this is a big break and big change that we observe under Delhi Sultanate. Definitely. And uh, sir, you also uh, uh, also mentioned that under uh, Muhammad Ghori, he made his uh, slaves as governors. That seems a bit uh, difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Muhammad Ghori is actually, he did not have any son. And uh, this, there was a, the slave culture was always there in Central Asia. People used to buy slaves. Right in the very childhood and they used to 
train them properly okay right. and then they were considered to be more loyal than even the sons right okay so that's why you know he appointed the slaves as governors because he could not have depended on any other heirs right or any other nobles so they he considered his own slaves whom he had trained and right. they were not only attached to him they were attached to him emotionally right so the other than the political attachment they were you know emotional attachment so to so then the they would ruler. be more loyal to him than somebody yeah of course appointed. and that's why he appointed all these slaves as governors right okay that makes much more sense and uh, so you also talked about establishment of the De uh, delhi sultanate released uh, new social forces could you throw more light on this you know uh, when we say we, when we talk about these social forces actually we are talking about the new artisanal class and uh, there are you know historians who suggest that because of this emergence of the new artisanal class even the bhakti movement came up so right you know this uh, emergence of the bhakti movement is not mere coincidence that is happening under delhi sultanate so historians feel that it is basically because of this you know emergence of new artisanal class and most of them belong to the lower caste categories that the bhakti movement in northern india right. emerges and all the leaders and saints of this bhakti movement belong to the lower caste categories yes so that is how historians talk about this right social mobility right thank you so much sir and uh, with this uh, we would like to uh, thank you for being here and for talking about uh, such an interesting topic about the delhi sultanate and uh, also viewers thank you so much for watching have a wonderful day <laughs>